my brother, uh, the one, his name is Charlie, the one I'm really close to, he makes a lot of jokes in bad taste, and it was a joke he made. He bought the TV for me this morning that got broken, and I was talking to him about whether it made sense to pay to fix it or whether I should get a new one, and it was always his joke that, like, he knew Danny treated me badly, and it was always his joke. He said, I, I, you know, I looked into hiring a hitman, and it was cheaper to get you this TV, so oh. instead I got you this TV. Okay. Um, I mean, he would never... <laughs> He's my big brother, and he's been taking care of me since I was little, but he would never. And I, I said, I told that to the repair guy this morning. Right. That's okay. <laughs> I said, he asked me how much it cost, and I said I didn't know because it was a gift, because my brother said it was cheaper than a hitman. It was my divorce present. Okay. It's such a horrible thing to say. I'm so sorry. That's okay. You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Okay, how is everyone? Well, I wanted to talk to you today. Finally, I think this may be my final show for a while about Wendy Adelson's interrogation because there's so much strange, excuse me, strange stuff in it. And I'm going at it at a snail's pace. So I'm so tired of listening to her and her boohoos, her fake boohoos, that I don't think I can take much more of it after today. For a little while, we'll take a little break and we'll come back to it. That's what I'm thinking today. Maybe tomorrow will be different. Who knows? But I wanted to, to present it just some of the odder moments in the interrogation, in the beginning part of the interrogation. Everybody talks about the big parts, like Wendy talking about her brother and the joke. But there's a lot of odder, smaller stuff that I don't hear a lot of people talk about. So that's what we're going to explore today. But before I do, it was Donna, Donna, Donna's birthday a couple days ago. Maybe it was it yesterday or the day before. Yes, I can't even remember. But appropriately, Jane's World made me for my birthday, which was on the third, a little video tribute with my Donna imitation. I wanted to show it to you guys. So let's take a look and then we'll get into your comments. No, 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 not Wendy, not your sister, nothing to do with your sister or your sisters, just some paperwork, just some plain old paperwork, just the kind we usually get at the dental office, that kind of regular, normal, non-murder involved paperwork. Th that's what it is, Charlie. Okay. We'll talk later. Okay. And delivered honey they hand delivered it they didn't they didn't send it through the mail they hand delivered it honey Charlie Charlie darling wake up they hand delivered it they want the five for a TV wink wink and I think we should just pay up <laughs> thank you Jane for that who, what a better, what a great birthday gift. Thank you so much. My Donna impression has been immortalized in your video. Thank you. So we got some interesting comments. We were talking about the same subject, Wendy Adelson's interrogation last time. 
Nurse Ratchet 1208 says, Roberta, you're right. Not one Adelson, except for Rob, would fit in with the Adler crowd, meaning Amy Adler, Jonathan Adler, the designer's sister, who teaches law at NYU and was dating Dan Markell. I'm imagining Charlie soaking in the Adler, Dunoonan, that's Jonathan Adler's husband, pool talking about <laughs> sexually his girlfriend. No, never. Even Foxy wouldn't stand for it. So Foxy the dog, <laughs> good point, Nurse Ratchet. Yeah, I think that Wendy talks about in this interrogation or police questioning is a better way to put it, Amy Adler's age and saying she's so beautiful because she is. She doesn't look 50, which she doesn't. But that's the one thing that Wendy has on Amy, is that she's younger. But you can see the jealousy, or I felt the jealousy. And apparently it was reported in the papers that Wendy was looking up Amy Adler's ex-husband, Trying to look for a new Patsy is the way I see it because Jeffrey Lacoste had blown his role as the Patsy by leaving early on his trip. And I just find it extremely interesting that when Wendy thinks of who could do this crime, it's always about jealousy. So either it's Jeffrey Lacoste is angry at Wendy for breaking up with him. So she goes, I mean, it doesn't really even make a lot of sense, but he goes and I guess he's valid, val in an act <laughs> to try to win her back. Kills Danny. Is that the idea? But it's always some kind of jealousy behind it. And Amy Adler's ex-husband, I don't know why he would want to do this, but it's always jealousy, Right. So it makes me think that Wendy was incredibly jealous of Dan Markell. And some of those issues have been talked about how she didn't, she felt intimidated by his academic pedigree, Harvard undergrad, Harvard law. And he just seemed to achieve very highly at everything he did. And you know, it seems to be one of those situations where you have a marriage with two flowers and no gardener. So two people who really need to be taken care of and maybe need someone to be not in the spotlight and the person behind the person and taking care of that person. But they both wanted big careers were very high achievers, and you can see what see how how it ended. Scratch fifty one ninety one says, "Don't read and speak. Introduction is too long. If you edited like a network rather than present yourself like you had one behind you, this would be twenty minutes long. You have opinions, great. Present them." somewhere rather than sing song <laughs> reading in quicksand this is horrible well i'm very flattered scratch that you think that i present myself like i have a network behind me because if people for people who've been listening to the show know that it's just me i'm a one woman band everything you see on this screen <laughs> I've done myself. So thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry you think it's too long or that I shouldn't read and talk. Should I read silently to myself? Is that what you're <laughs> saying? And let people catch up. I'm not sure. Thank you, though. Uh, S-S-H-E-M-S-11 says, why is it so important to Wendy that everyone knows, even though her parents were really mad at Danny, that they'd never that they'd never said a bad word about him in front of the boys, quote unquote. 
She goes to great lengths to explain this to Detective Isom. And during Charlie's trial, she made sure she read that part of the interview transcript to the jury. I submit this was so important to her because Danny was murdered for accusing Donna of disparaging him to his sons and requesting her contacts with them be supervised. It's a really good point. This is what finally crossed the line into the murder plan. Really insightful comment. If you've been listening, I've been saying that relocation was just one part. Donna would have been devastated to have to say to her friends, I'm just going to my supervised visitation with the grandkids. Nothing to it. If, if she would even let that out, so much of, I would think, her image and everything about this family is image, power, control, and revenge. So much of her image was about around her being a grandparent, and this was a time when the kids were kindergarten age. She was a kindergarten teacher, just the right age for Donna to grandparent them. And this was also a huge bruise to her ego. How dare you tell me that I don't know how to be a grandparent? I This is my specialty, children this age. I would never disparage them. Because I think that's what they tell each other, this family. So what they tell each other doesn't have a lot to do with reality. <laughs> sort of gaslighting each other. So I can imagine Donna say, oh, I would never, I would never disparage Danny in front of your children, never. Even though Dan Markell heard it with his own ears. I'd never do it. I'd never, ever, in a million trillion years would I disparage Dan Markell. I'm way too busy baking him banana bread and getting ready for that big hug. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? She made him banana bread and gave him a hug on their last meeting. Come on. But really insightful comment. I agree with you. So everybody talks about the relocation. But I think equally, if not more, of the motivation for this murder was Donna supervised, the prospect of Donna having supervised, only supervised visitation with her grandkids, and of course, Wendy's being publicly humiliated, maybe censured, her law license censured. In what way, we don't know if that would have even happened, but it seems pretty clear that she didn't tell the whole truth about her finances on her submissions to the court. So let us, thank you for your comments, let us get into it, shall we? Oh, hello, Miss Lisa. If you're not subscribed to Miss Lisa's channel, she's making great shorts too, just like Jane's world on this case. Thanks so much for, for the super sticker. I appreciate it. All right, let's get into it, shall we? Drive down, Trescott's blocked. You turn around, you go back around on Benton, and then you go to the <laughs> Sorry, we're a little ahead of ourselves here. Drive down, Trescott's blocked. You turn around, you go back around on Benton, and then you go <laughs> to the tree. Right. Pardon? I thought it was like a tree that fell down or right. something. Right. So. I didn't even think, like, that's the house. I just, I saw a few houses blocked off, and I just. I'm sorry, I don't waste any time. No, you're not wasting my time. Did you, I think I asked you before. So can we talk about how absurd that is? She drives up to the scene. She sees police cars. She sees police tape. 
and she thinks it's a tree has fallen. I mean, how absurd. But yet the realtor who just hears about something going on on Trescott calls her. Heard there was a shooting. Heard something was going on. But Wendy is right up to her old house. Doesn't know that the children have been dropped off yet. Doesn't know if they're okay. Doesn't call doesn't call the the school to make sure they're okay. Just assumes it was a tree. It's so, and what I got editing this is just how many times she asks that she's a suspect and asks for more information. Why, how did you get my car here? Oh, there's uh, so many more. What condition is he in? What happened? How did, how were the police called? She wants all the information because she's a control freak because that will inform her performance. But I will tell you, as someone who edited this and has watched this a lot, I will tell you it's worse the more you watch it, the more you can see the seams. The first time everything kind of goes by very quickly and you feel like there's something wrong, but you're not sure exactly why, why it doesn't feels off. Of course, I picked out right away that her she's out of breath. She's huffing and puffing. And the next minute, she's talking at full volume. But there's so much more. She's constantly asking, I know I should be a suspect. And then when she actually gets her hands tested for gunpowder, you'll see residue, gunpowder residue. You'll see she starts to panic a little. So her biggest concern is just getting out of the interrogation room. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, we just have to eliminate everything. Okay. You know what she's saying, right? I'm assuming I'm a suspect. I can't no, you're not a suspect. You, you, I'm not. I'm not. I don't consider you a suspect. I asked you to come up here. You came up here voluntarily. I'm not read you Miranda. You are not under arrest. You are the closest thing to family that I have to Daniel right now. Okay. You are. I'm so sad for. I can't. So I was thinking about something else. He told me that he comes. We have week on week off, but on Wednesdays we do an overnight. Right. And he told me that he might have some work up in New York, and he might not be back in time for the Wednesday overnight. So there's no way that he did this because he was he had all kinds of plans like for next week. That but you're saying he would not hurt himself. No. Okay. All right. It wasn't him. Okay. He has no reason to hurt himself or anything like that. No, I mean, okay. I can see him being really sad when we first got divorced. Right. But now. I can see him being really sad over me, Wendy Adelson, because no man ever gets over me. So Janet Moorcraft says, thank you very much. Also, Dan had a case against Wendy. Yeah. He was asking that, that she, the court censure her. And her law license was in jeopardy. So at minimum, she could have just been given a talking to by the court, an admonishment. But at worst, she could have had her law license taken away. And after going through law school, you know how hard that is. All that work for nothing, just to have it taken from you. And what a hu public humiliation. Her law license was in jeopardy. Yes. Thank you, Janet. Yeah, it's a really... A point everybody talks about relocation but I feel like that was equally a big emotive if not more thanks again Janet more craft how did she not call about her two little boys it's amazing isn't it you think about something happening on the street I just remember times when I get weather reports from where my mom lives and I'll, I'm calling right away if I hear there's a flood or anything, but there's something on her old street where her ex-husband lives and she just thinks it's a tree with crime, crime scene tape. So that's why I say she thought there was a, a massive crime done against a tree. Clearly the police needed to come out and investigate. Absurd. 
he's got Amy, and he loves those boys. Okay. And things were really good for him. There's no way he did this to himself. Okay. I believe you. Which really scares me because it means there's someone out there that's willing to do this to him, and I'm, I'm scared for the kids. Okay. I, I understand you're... So what's so interesting is she mentions the kids coming after, people coming after the kids, and she asked the police, then Sarah, the victim's advocate, over and over again, is someone's coming to my kids? And they're like all like, no, there's no indication of that, Wendy. Not at all. So she takes all their advice about what to say, what to cancel, what appointments to cancel, because she asked for a lot of advice. Because being an antisocial personality, she has no idea how to behave. She can only really mimic normal, I don't know, what we would consider in the spectrum of appropriate behavior so much. And also because she also knows, in my opinion, she was part of the planning. So they're telling her what an innocent person would do. She's asking the questions, really, what would an innocent person do? How would they act? Would they cancel their appointments? Yes, Wendy. Yes, they would. <laughs> but she's also asking over and over again because she's desperate to change those kids' names. So she's dying for the police or the victim's advocate to say one thing, one little hint that maybe someone could be coming after her or the kids. But they never do. But she continues on with the plan anyway, even without the support of the, what the police said or what the victim's advocate said. You'll see it comes up a lot in this. They're coming to attack the kid. No, they're basically telling her that Yiddish, Meshugana, does anyone know what that <laughs> crazy? It's a Meshugana idea. Wendy, it's a honey, it's a Meshugana idea. They're not coming after your kids, honey. <laughs> Drop it, leave it, forget about it. I know you're in shock, quote unquote, but forget about it. Here we go. Okay. Hi. She's got to do, you she's got to swab your hands. Oh, first I'm going to have to do your hands. Okay. Stand for that shot residue. Residue? Residue. Okay. This is a really hard job you guys have. This is also very suspicious. I don't know if you've ever listened to his statement analysis, but one of the things that people who tend to be guilty who end up being guilty doing 911 calls is ingratiate themselves with the police. So if it's a missing person, so it, so they'll be overly polite where people who are really looking for help don't have time to be polite. And often in a missing person case, you'll see when the person responsible for that person being missing goes on TV, they'll say, oh, the police are doing such a good job. So they're trying to align themselves with law enforcement. But in reality, if your daughter's missing or your loved one's missing, you would be completely dissatisfied with the police. They haven't found that person. They're doing a terrible job. But here, Wendy, oh, you have such a hard job. You're so soothing to the victim's advocate. Really trying to ingratiate herself. She wants them to, she needs them to like her so she can get out of that room and on with her life. Can be, all right, right hand. Okay, and are you right or left handed? Um, I'm, I do, I work with both. Okay. <laughs> but uh, right, right handed. Okay, left hand. Since noon today, have you washed your hands at all? 
I wish I could tell you I had, but I haven't. Okay. I'm filthy. Okay. And a picture, correct? Yeah. Take a picture. I'm just gonna take a picture with my hands. Uh, no, no of you. you. Just, you stand, just stand, up, stand up, and then you can go to the bathroom. Okay. Page, I thought the same thing as a left-handed person. I hate when people say, well, I write with my right hand, but I, I can brush my hair with both hands. <laughs> so can everybody, right? You're not, why are people so obsessed with being ambidextrous? I guess it's another special quality she wants to have. So unusual, right? She wants people to say, oh, you're so unusual, so talented. Thanks, Paige, for bringing that up. So this I find very interesting. So her last time she saw Dan Markell, it's hard to know if it really happened or not, but she says she sees him at a Whole Foods and she doesn't want to say hello, but she immediately takes the kids to a burger joint. Not too much kosher food at a burger joint. And I would think that this is Wendy getting her hostility out. Barb Nauman, thanks so much. Wendy never says my boys will be devastated, crushed, etc. to hear their father is dead. Excuse me. She can't put herself in their shoes. Bet the police caught that. Caught it. They seem to catch something. Did police are incredibly intuitive, as I've said before. When I've interviewed police, they always know the next question I'm going to ask. It's, it makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. It's very creepy. You think they've gotten inside your head. They're just very familiar with people and what's how people behave. I mean, we like to think we're all so different, but we're much more alike than we are different. And our behavior is similar within a spectrum of normal human behavior. But changing the boy's name is this way off of, of norm normality. But also what she says, Barb, is how do I tell the kids? Not how are the kids going to take this? How are they going to ever be a whole? Really harped on that last episode. But I find that very weird. How am I going to tell them? Because everything difficult in life seems to be besides schoolwork and academia, seems to be done for her. Long trips. And that's what, what money will do. It will make life much more comfortable and easy. ...in the window of the Whole Foods, and I took him to Burger Fi instead. Oh. Because he and I were, you know, divorced, right. and interactions with him were hard. And it was my one day with the kids, and I thought, well, if we go inside, it's going to be like all of us together, and I wanted time by myself that's with fine. them. So I took them, but that's the last time I saw him. So okay. I saw him sitting there Wednesday afternoon working. He, he was inside Whole Foods? He was inside Whole Foods okay. with his computer, like, okay. writing. And the kids came out? The kids didn't see him. Okay. We were just about to enter. I saw him. I thought, oh, my one day with the kids, okay. you know? And so I went, went and got burgers instead. To the burger fry. Okay. All right. So then then Thursday... I got a call. You got called about the alarm. Had you had any contact with the kids during that time? On Thursday, I, I had them Wednesday night. I brought them to school on Thursday. And then, no, not after I dropped them off. Okay. And there's a record at school of, like, when you log in. So right. I probably dropped them off a little before 9, but they could tell you what okay. time. All right. And then... Uh, so then he kept them last night, mm -hmm. Thursday night, and then he would have driven them to school. Mm -hmm. What time does he normally drop them off at school? It varies. Sometimes he has breakfast with them. Um, I got the call from him. It was 9.04, I think. Right. So he must have already just dropped them off and was probably driving from school to the gym. And that's why he was saying, go into this class. I'll touch base with you after. Okay. All right. And then no contact after that. 
We had some texting contact. That's when I was saying that my last contact wasn't very nice. I was saying, well, I wanted to pick them up at 3, and he was saying, well, you are only allowed them after 4.30, and I was like, well, what about last week? I picked them up at 5, and he said I was just being nice, and I said, I guess nice was fun while it lasted. Okay. That's the last thing I said to him. Okay. So this is what makes me think he's not so such a, a such a terrible husband. It's because Wendy goes through great lengths to say what a great guy he is. He means when he's not annoying everyone and he's not being terrible to his wife in a way that she wouldn't want her kids to know about. Take check this one out. This is this is a classic Wendy line here. He and I got along fine for the sake of the kids. You heard the message where he was like, well, maybe we'll just take a walk around school. And right. I mean, I found him hard to be around, but <laughs> so did a lot of people. They all knew he meant well. He was a decent, good human being. He wouldn't, he wouldn't hurt anybody. He would never do this to anybody. I don't know who would want to hurt him like this. I really he would never hurt anyone. And then she goes on to say that he was terrible to her. You don't hear this kind of discrepancy. Like he was a great guy, except to me when he was being terrible to me. And letting everyone know that I was mentally ill at, at my job. So she can't imagine anyone being angry with him after he's treated her terribly. This is craziness. This is crazy talk. I really don't. All right. I, have, I, I need to ask you, was your divorce, did, you said before, it had nothing to do with infidelity, no extramarital affairs or anything like that? Neither one of us. It was just simply the fact that you all just didn't get along anymore, or was it just the fact that he was belligerent to you he never hurt me physically but he was he was emotionally abusive okay and I didn't tell most people that so all okay. most people know is we it just didn't work out and it's just the kids are young and this is just better in this way um, so other than my family who saw the way he treated me most people were well I think his family was very surprised um, he told everyone around the community that I was mentally ill because only a crazy person would leave him and okay. So there's a lot. So I love that she adds that onto it. And she says that in her podcast. I'm working on an episode for Patreon about her podcast where she says the same thing that only a mentally ill person would leave him. That's why she he thinks she's mentally ill. Not that like Jeffrey Lacoste and anyone who's probably dated her comes to the conclusion that despite all her achievements, this is a deeply disturbed, emotionally out of control woman. So I think Dan Markell, when he says to her, "You're the only, I'm the only one who knows what a terrible person you really are, meaning I'm the only one who's seen behind the mask. I bet he's right. But I love how she presents it like it's, it's so Wendy to be always play the victim. Something wrong with him. He's such an egomaniac. That I'm a bad person for not loving him enough or whatever. Airdre, <laughs> I wonder if Wendy, thank you. Wendy and Wendy didn't shower. This is a good point because she thinks she'd look guilty if she'd showered off to prove that she wasn't trying to hide evidence. It's odd. It's really odd. I've also heard people say that they think that the plan was never to go to lunch. She thought she would be called before then to the police station. So it looks like she's just puttering around the house. So she didn't have to get ready for lunch, but 
to go to lunch with your girlfriends like that? I can understand maybe coffee with one friend. <laughs> if it's a quickie or something. I'm trying to think back, but with lunch, it, it tends to be, I tend, you tend to get ready a little bit. Try to look presentable. It's interesting. She didn't want to think that she was showering or sh her hands. That's an interesting theory. She looks very calm and collected. Other than I think she's worrying about having to stay there longer as a suspect in the police station when they're about to do the test on her hands and take her picture. Um, um, but you know, who would, yeah, so that, I mean, that's it. The circumstances, plain and simple, where it just wasn't a really healthy marriage. And I thought it'd be better for the boys if they didn't grow up thinking that's the way you treat women. But he wasn't, he didn't hit me, he didn't hit them. He didn't have a drug problem, he, you know, he didn't gamble, he didn't cheat on me, I didn't cheat on him. There's no other, I don't, I, I keep thinking the only like unknown I, I can think of is like Amy's ex-husband, like is he still in the picture, is he upset? Right. Danny, I, um, I defriended him from Facebook because I found it too upsetting to like see intermittent pictures of the kids. Um, but I wonder, he's very, very public on Facebook about like where he is, when he's traveling, where he's going. And so I wonder if he's got pictures up of him and Amy and if there's a jealous ex-husband in the... You know where this ex-husband would be? He'd be in New York too. Is he also an attorney? I don't even know his name. Okay. Um, I have that skirt. Do you? It's pretty. I'm sure I'll get it. I got my hat. So many people do. <laughs> So again, she says, we look like twins. We have the same skirt. We look so alike. We have the same skirt. Really trying to say that align herself with, with, with law enforcement. I'm not the criminal here. I'm one of you. You know my friends. She starts mentioning your friends who worked as advocates just like Sarah. It's really bizarre. Janet, thanks. Thanks so much. I heard that Katie made a post-sentence deal with the prosecution. They need her testimony for future Adelson trial. Her sentence was reduced. Could it be? Do you finish? Hold on. Let me see. Did you finish in the regular chat? I'm not sure where you're going janet just sent don't send, <laughs> you don't have to send me any more money just tell me <laughs> where you were going at the end could it be i'm not sure well katie's pro offer ended up being very disappointing i'm hoping that she'll wake up and tell all it's like she's protecting an image that she doesn't have. She's never had. She's pretending she didn't know anything. She thought he was going to be roughed up. So. We don't know how her sentence has been reduced yet. It says to be determined still. Hold on. Actually, I can show you. Oh, did I take it down? I might, I might have taken it down. Hold on. Let me see if I still have it. Yeah, I do. Okay, here. So let me take yours down. Hold on one second. There's too, too busy. Too busy over here. But Katie McBanawa, this is from Gigi from Pretty Lies and Alibis channel. She put this up in her community chat. Katie McBanawa has an account on meet an inmate and when it 
it says her sentence, it says to be determined. So they haven't decided yet what they're going to reduce it by. So pretty interesting. I hope she spills it all. I think she knows much more. And I don't know, they're not paying for her lawyer anymore. That's how I see it. I know, I know they went to the judge and they convinced the judge that Sigfredo Garcia and Katie were both paying for their private lawyers. I have a hard time believing that. Jackie C. A slice of banana bread for you. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Thanks for becoming a, a member. They're so worried about my kids. I don't know how I'm going to tell them what happened. And you know, they're, they're so little. And, you know, it, it is difficult sometimes for the kids because they're sexually They love their dad. <laughs> I'm sorry, you can ask me questions. No, no, you're fine. Talk to me about what you want to talk to me about. It's fine. I'll tell you what you um what you No, you're good though. Like I wanna be here for you too. I think this very strong. Uh, I have I just like I can't I can't believe this is happening. I don't understand and I'm very scared because if this can happen, like what if someone's gonna come after the kids? Like why are who did this and why would and they from, do this? And from you know what they're missing, they haven't had any indication of that. Do you think someone can watch the kid like the house where I'm gonna be with the kids? So Debbie Gibby, thank you for clarifying. So Debbie Gibby says to Janet Moorcraft. Katie has no deal for now until after the trials are done in the Georgia and the DA will talk and see what, if anything, they will do for her. She's doing life. And which is so hard to, to contemplate knowing that she was offered more than once. No time. <laughs> Just if she talked. They weren't looking to give her life in prison if she if she told the truth. But instead, she had Donna and Charlie, this is my opinion, in her ear saying, it's all going to be great. We're going to get you the best lawyers. We're going to, as long as everyone stays quiet, they can't prove anything. They don't have anything. They don't have enough. We'll all get acquitted. Look how that turned out. And not that I feel badly for the Adelsons, but this didn't exactly work as work out as planned. The whole family's de destroyed, not in the way the Markells are. They're living a life sentence of grief, but certainly the idea that they they pay for this to be done and walk away unscathed Maybe some people would suspect, but they couldn't ever prove it. I think that was the original plan. Boy, has that turned out terribly. It's tonight to make sure that well, nobody comes after us. We'll discuss kind of that type of stuff. I'm going to make sure that they know all your concerns and fears. Okay. I just... Take step one step at a time though right now. I know it's hard. I don't know. I don't know how I'm gonna tell them. You know, I I can tell you this. I again, again, again. They're coming after the boys. They're coming after the boys. No, Wendy, no one's gonna tell you that that's a normal fear. Because generally people who kill adults don't go after their children. We're not living in the godfather. Part two. I think it's going to be best coming from you, their mother. You seem very educated and put together. 
<laughs> and it sounds like you've gone through a lot the past two years. She's so easily flattered. And it makes me think about what kind of mother Donna is. She must be such a cold mother who doesn't give compliments easily. Sure, she'll agree with Charlie when he compliments himself, but she doesn't seem one to readily give many compliments out. So Wendy just is so hungry for any kind of flattery. She has such a large narcissistic side. It's like a hole that can never be filled. My eyes, tell me again how blue my eyes are, how pretty I am, how smart I am, how many friends I have. How do you know how many friends I have? I know, I know that something terrible has just happened, but how do you know I have so many friends? You guys remember that part of this? It's the beginning. And what the kids have been doing so well with everything. They're really like happy, well adjusted kids. They have so many people in their life that you all are doing them. the right thing. And I get why I would be a suspect, but the idea that we were divorced, but I would the idea that I would ever do anything is like I understand I understand why they need to check, but and I would never do anything to this guy who was so terrible to me. So a ter terrible to me that I didn't want my children to see the way he treated me. I, ha I was so afraid of him. I had to leave him while he was at, on a, excuse me, on a business trip in New York. And then he didn't know where the kids were. He thought I'd kidnapped the kids. It's great, <laughs> that part. He was so terrible. I was so afraid of him. I had to make up a nickname, divorce him while he was out of town, take everything I wanted from the house, clear out the bank accounts, all while he was away because I was so afraid of him. Thank you, Veronica Sawyer, for becoming a member. Slice, round of banana bread for everybody. I don't think I did investigate. I just talked to you at all about like what your role is in this. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out. And, and a lot of times they do stuff just to kind of cancel you out too. That's fine. I understand. Okay. Um, I understand. I just, I just can't believe this is happening. So. Here, but. Um, Where are they located? I just so. So she wants her parents to come immediately. She wants support. She wants some co stars for her performance, some backup for her great performance here in the police station. Because she can't parent, she can't be around the kids. She's afraid for her life and the kids' life. That's what she's telling them. And she keeps saying, a crazy person did this. A crazy person did this. And as I was editing this, I was like, yeah, you're right, Wendy. A crazy person did do this. Their names are Charlie Adelson, Donna, 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 Donna Adelson, and Wendy Adelson. Crazy people. Because I think this is the, the thing that fascinates people about this case is the fact that a mother would kill the father of her children and scar them for life for her own immature needs and selfishness and need for revenge and need to win. I mean, such a competitive family. I mean, they didn't show up on game shows for, for nothing. They love to compete. Set right now that I'm worried about parenting effectively. Mm -hmm. So if my well, that's why if my parents here. were here, they could help me. They're really close with the kids, mm -hmm. so they could help me. I feel like you and I look a little bit alike. Do you see this as you're looking at my face? You have very pretty blue eyes. They're much bluer than mine. <laughs> but I feel like 
Thank you. Airdre, Wendy's jealousy of Dan was one of her motives. That's what I'm starting to think. How is the only time she can think of a motive for this crime? It's always jealousy. Either it's Jeffrey Lacoste being so jealous of, of Dan and that he has win all of Wendy's attention and that he's going to win her back. Or it's Amy Adler's ex-husband. It's always jealousy. They can't even think Donna and Wendy, who I think really thought, thought this thing up, I think Charlie was just the one who implemented it. I don't think he has the kind of depth to, to organize a TV alibi and, and all the script writing that was needed in this plot. Excuse me, I had a cough. But every time, every time the subject comes up of who can do this, it's always jealousy. Cute dog. And thank you. So this is just funny because, of course, she knows what's going to happen. In this room. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know it's not the. It's not like pictures from no, no. no. I just feel like I'm in a Twilight Zone, and I keep picturing the kids like at a funeral and we just say goodbye to their dad and I just I just take can't it one believe I have to do this to them. Do you um <laughs> did you see that? Did you guys all hear that? I can't believe I have to do this to them. There's a little slip there, Wendy. So she felt that she had to do this to them somehow. And I believe that Donna said that they'll have the most advantages, be the happiest with the Adelson family because they feel they're the best, the best in the world. No family is more equipped. She's a former kindergarten teacher to raise these boys and will raise them exactly the right way and they'll be fine. But when he knows that what they're going to go through is not going to be pleasant. But she doesn't have the maturity to see that you don't ever get over this. Ever. No matter what your circumstances are, it leaves a hole for, for the rest of your life that never heals. For what? For what? Because she can't handle... Being public, the public humiliation of perhaps losing her license or being admonished in court or losing her job or not having the career that she wants for a little while. But really, I think it's about control and they don't want, they want to just eliminate Dan's influence totally. That's part of it too. And ultimately, Dan Markell won't be pushed around. And so he pushed back legally in big ways. And I believe it was Harvey who says, you don't F with the Adelson family. Something along those lines. Do you want me, when I find their numbers, do you, is it okay if I call yeah. your friends? Yeah, okay, it's fine. And I can go and tell them I that you... Use some help okay. taking care of the boys tonight. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, I'm trying to think of who else I would call. My closest friend in town is on vacation right now. Um, all right, so we're working on the... the, mm -hmm. the... Yep, Joanna's trying to make contact now with some friends. Okay, and then... They'll come here, hopefully. Mm -hmm. okay. Hopefully, as long as she needs. Do you think I need to? I, I had like a whole weekend of plans ahead with the kids and stuff. Like, should I start contacting people and let them know that like I can't? I just. What's a good idea? Um, I just like I'm not gonna. I can't 
show up for like play dates right now. So sure, I'm, yeah. Um, um, I don't know. Like, do you want me not to tell people what's going on? Is this like? Well, I got that call from Lisa Perry. So like, how did she find out? Well, she said she saw something in Everett or heard she something. She said she right? heard there was a shooting on Trescott. Right. She wants all this information, and she's gloating. She's loving this. It makes her feel incredibly powerful. She gets incredible pleasure out of it. Because this is just, there's no, she must feel like a god now. She decides who lives and dies. Her family, she does. She made the call. I don't believe for a second her family would do this without her okay and participation. Jane World, too. If you're not subscribed to her channel, you're missing out. Very interesting videos on this case. Not all on my Donna imitation. Wendy Adelson, oopsie. How should I make out this check? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it's so absurd. She wants to know everything that went on. Because first of all, she wants to know because she's just so curious. But the more information she has to know how it goes down, she can modify her story and her performance to it. But also at the same time, she wants to know every, all the details because this kind of thing makes her feel good, makes her feel powerful and victorious. This was a long, long battle between these, these, between Dan Markell and that whole Adelson family. And they had the last word. And that's what, what, what these crimes are about. Power, really power. And, re and this one's about revenge. I thought cause she's a real estate agent. Maybe she right. was rolling around and she saw Trescott, but how did like is there is it on the news like did well i can tell you that there was news media out there with cameras but i don't know if anything has been reported as to as to the specific address okay um i don't know what our public information office has released i'm asking for you like okay i what's i don't want to like make this she wants to know what she can tell people or what she can't right now which in well, terms of making you, things better or worse for you um I would say that for right now, you know, I would not deny to anybody that something did happen. But, but if could, I'm, I'm going to call and cancel all my, like, I'm supposed to be at a party right. tonight, like. Okay, I can't. And basically, I can't go. There's, there's been an so incident. I Wait, so it doesn't look good if, if I party? So when Casey Anthony went dancing on the tables, that wasn't well received? When her little girl, when she was dealing with a tragedy, her little girl <laughs> was missing. That didn't go over well. I really should cancel my my events. It's so absurd. But she really doesn't know what's what's normal, I think. She's asking them, what do what do victims usually do in this situation? And she's even asking them to write the script. Because the truth doesn't sound so great. Well, it finally came to fruition. My family and I, this is my opinion, speaking, don't sue me, Wendy. We, are, we arranged for a murder by hire. We paid for a murder of my ex-husband. And now I'm at the police station. I want to get out of here really quick so I can hightail it to Miami to never, ever participate again in the investigation. And just to make it clear, Wendy did not want to take the stand in any of these cases that she did. She only did it because she had to and was given immunity. And the Adelsons, both Harvey and Donna, were subpoenaed to testify at Charlie's trial. And they said, look, if you bring us up there, we're just going to take the fifth. So they had both sides had to agree to never mention that. 
that they were going to take the fifth or that they were called to testify and wouldn't. So they just, the state was like, what's the point of getting Donna up here to do her version of the Chappelle sketch? I take the fifth. -a. That's a horrible question. I'm going to have to take the fifth again. I'm going to take the fifth. That's a horrible. I can just see her just getting really feisty too on the stand being like, that's a horrible thing to, to say. That's a horrible. Who would do that? A horrible thing to do. No, I did not, but I'm taking the fifth. I cannot say whether I did or not. <laughs> right. Oh, I can't wait for Donna's trial. Just tell people I'm just not going to be able to be right. there. I'll talk to you later. And that's right. it. That's okay. It. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't want you. I don't. I don't want you not to have a support network of friends. Yeah. And well, I and will tell who needs to know. But right. like, I also, I don't. I don't. You uh, want to explain this to thousand people? Well, it's not about. It's yes. Mm -hmm. um, but I, and I don't think that's good for the kids. Like, I don't want people. I don't know what to do about like the kids are really young. I don't know what to do in terms of that, that reaction. But I also am kind of scared that there's like some maniac out there, and I, I would like for you to find whoever that is. So I don't. So did you guys catch it again? There might be some maniac out there. You're the maniac, Wendy. It's you. You're the maniac. Your mother's the maniac. Your father's the maniac. And your brother's the maniac. They're all in your own family. And you're all running to be with them and get closer to them after this crime. But did you hear it again? There might be a maniac out at, out at, for her or her children, because she always has to play the victim. And she's dying to change those kids' names. She's dying to get to Miami to, to safety. But if she really wanted to be safe, she would have changed her name to Wendy Smith. She would have changed her. And she might have even changed her first name to Wendy with a Y. <laughs> right? But instead, her family is notorious now. And they're all still walking around with her name. It doesn't make any sense. Well, it does. If you, if you It does make sense. If It just doesn't make any sense why she hasn't been arrested yet. But I guess they're going to wait till the end of Donna's trial. They're building it like a house. It's just you feel very impatient, or I do covering this case it seems like she's had freedom enough years of freedom want to make things worse in some way in terms of you being able to find someone okay all that's right. all i'm asking just i uh, i would just only tell just, the people that need to know that okay. are closest to you for your benefit manira sultana says lily smith <laughs> lily stone you remember josh stone and lily whatever her name was in the book. So Dan Markell's name in her book was Josh Stone, which reminds me of Fifty Shades of Grey character. That's what I would imagine. That's what it makes me think of. And Lily. Lily, the fragile Lily. Lily, the advocate Lily, the good person Lily. Good. And anyone else, uh, if they inquire, just you can tell them any excuse you want. You can say, the police have asked me not to discuss it. Okay. It's as simple as that. So this is where she's very upset that Dan Markell is still alive. She thought it was all done. Now she's got she's still got to wait. And what we know from Ruth Markell's book, The Unveiling, highly recommended if you haven't read it, is that Wendy was calling about Dan Markell's finances and if she could get any of his money, insurance, benefits, et cetera, et cetera. But they had all been moved over to his sister. But I still think that she, actually, I think the sister runs that, but I still think she did benefit financially, but I can't remember how. Can you guys re remind me? I thought she did get some money from this that she doesn't talk about, but maybe I'm wrong. Am I wrong? 
but she was calling very quickly afterwards to find out if she was if she was the beneficiary. So this would delay it if he were still alive. I'm not sure what investigator I some kind of told you. You know that he's still alive. No, I didn't know that. He's he's is he possibly gonna make it? I don't know the answer he, that I know. He made it sound like he was gone. So does that mean that he might be okay? You don't I know? don't think from what it sounds like, I don't think he'll be the, the same. same. Okay, but if, he might make it. I don't want be... to give you that false hope. I'm sorry, I just no, thought it's he okay. was gone and now I don't know what to tell. It's sort of a game changer. I know, and that's why I was kind of asking. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jamie. So thank you, Lynn, True Crime Project. She got some money for the boys' expenses. Jamie Hayes says she got his 401k, and then she got also some of his death benefits. 4800 a month for the kids. She gets 4K from, it's around $4,000 a month from Social Security. Is that a month or a year? That sounds like yearly, right? I mean, a monthly. That's that's no small change, or not to me, it isn't. Uh, uh, Rabbit says, of course, Wendy asks about attending the party that night. The party will simply fall apart without Wendy's presence. Great point, Rabbit. Great point. I didn't think of that. Yeah. Perceptive. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that. He made, I mean, it I like, he made it sound like he was God. I don't think it's good, though. Um, I know it's, I mean, that's sort of what he said, but I assumed he was saying that, like, euphemistically. Mm -hmm. um, and, that's, and that's why I'm kind of at, because I didn't want, and I don't want to be misleading in this conversation. Is there any way to find out if, like, because if he might be okay, like, I want to bring the kids to him so that they can... And that kind of stuff we'll talk about in a little little but let me ask him <laughs> um i just think that's different right like if no, he's not gonna is. make it and he can see the kids one more time then he should see them so is there like are we getting updates from the hospital they, they have been you know they were at the hospital obviously when you know something like this happens they do go to the hospital how did how did this so when it happened, did someone call the police because they heard a gunshot or something? I like, how would it, how would they know to t like? Did he call the police? How would they know to take him to the hospital? I don't know the answers to all these. And I'm not, you know, I just I'm gonna let when Investor Eisen comes back in here, I'll let you kind of ask some of those questions. Okay. Um. Okay. Okay. Um. But I didn't want you to think. I'm sorry. I just didn't want you to think that he was. Leaving. I thought he was gone. And that that's what I was getting from your conversation, and I didn't want it to be. If he's still alive, I need to make different choices. Right. I want the boys to be with him. I don't know. I mean, if he looks scary, then... Right, and that's the way. Is that why? Does he look scary? See, this is I find a part I find very interesting. So she says, I want the boys to be with him, thinking that Sarah's going to reflect back. Oh, you're such a loving mother. You're so wonderful. Excuse me, I had to cough. But instead, she looks horrified. And then Wendy, because she, in my opinion, is an antisocial personality and picks up very quickly on people's expressions, because she's a master manipulator and you need that skill. You develop that skill being a master manipulator. She sees Sarah as horrified. And she says, oh, what, does he look really scary? Well, then I don't want to traumatize him. So now she'll go the other way. One second ago, it was absolutely necessary that she bring her children to the hospital to be with them so they can spend their last moments with their father. But now that it's been frowned upon, she's going to reverse it and go absolutely the other way. Yeah, Mo says this woman is so guilty. This is what I felt 
looking at this footage. It's just so obvious when you watch it more than once. And nothing against Craig Isom. I think he had his suspicions, but he's just putting the case together. We know all the facts now. And frankly, she's smarter than the average criminal. We'll say that. I hate to give her a compliment, but she is. Is that why? I don't know. I I haven't seen him because I think I think that would be more traumatizing for the kids to see like something horrible. Right. Um, I don't want them to. And I will say, from a victim advocate perspective, yep. I always recommend people not, to, especially young children. I They're mean, so little. I mean, they right. could like. I want them to have. If it's gonna have to be memories, I want them to be good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because their last memory would have been him taking them to school this morning. Mm -hmm. This morning. <laughs> is the is the police officer? Hold on one second. Thank you so much. Jen DeSimo, thank you. Just found your channel and love your commentary. Thanks so much, Jen. This is Kat in a, in a hat says, the victim's advocate, this is Saren, who's been promoted. Gone places in the same field has the kind of personality that Wendy Adelson preys upon a little naive, kind, quote unquote, normal, and very forthcoming with information. Very insightful, Kat. I agree with you. A little bit like Tova Walsh. She's getting sucked in. But near the end, she starts to get on to Wendy and Wendy says to her, I'm not sending you, I'm not just sending you out for busy work, which sounds like she's sending her out for busy work to my ear that Sarah, the victim's advocate is, is looking a little too closely at her. So she sends her away with some little errands to do for her. Because she can't totally manipulate her. She's not quite as pliable as she as she would like. That that's just my take on it. But I think you're 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 right on for the right on there, Kat. Amy Jensen. Slice of banana bread for you, Amy. Thank you for becoming a member of the channel. Welcome aboard. Are still at school? Like, are the boys safe there right now? I don't know the for sure answer to that, but I do know that they checked on them. And I know I they checked on them, I, but like the kids, I just want to make sure they're okay. okay. Let me let me go talk and let me ask them that for you. I, Wendy, look at me. There's no reason for them to think that anything's going to happen to the boys right now. Okay. Okay. And I just want you to know that there's no indications that. But why would someone do this? Like, why would they just come after my whole family? I do hear your concern. I, I do. I just want you to know, though, like, there's no, if there was an indication. I mean, there's no indication some crazy person was going to kill Danny, so right. why would they not think someone was going to, like, anything could happen, right? From what I understand. Anything could happen, right? Just, I just want to put the words in your mouth, anything could happen, so I can have a reason why I changed the kids' names and moved to Miami so quickly. Please just say anything could happen. How can we can we agree on that? It's like she's cross-examining Sarah. And she will not stop until Sarah says, or Craig Isom, either one. She'll take either one. Anything could happen, right? To the kids. Anything. Crazy person. You didn't know a crazy person was going to do this. And you're looking at that crazy person and my crazy brother and my crazy mother. We're the crazy people who did this. You didn't know we're out here doing this kind of stuff. How would you know what's going to happen to my kids next? 
understood that there was someone that was at the school. I did they don't... find? Did they, they don't? They didn't find anyone like running away at the scene, did they? I don't know that answer. Okay. Someone asked. I'm so sorry. Someone asked way back. Did anyone notice if her eyes are? if a tear ever came from her eyes or if her eyes were red and this quality of this video is so poor. It's hard to know if she, if her great acting that Donna says you can be a, a, a wonderful actress when you, when you apply yourself, I, I know she used different words when you want to be, I think she says you can be a great actress when you want to be Wendy. We're all counting on you for this big performance in the police station to sell this. But it's hard to know if she actually squeezed some tears out of those eyes. But she couldn't have gotten that upset because she can talk full. I know I keep going back to that, but she can talk. Breath, her voice is fully supported by her breath. Something you don't get when you're really upset. How many times have people said to you when you're really hysterically crying, breathe, breathe, and you're like, <laughs> just to even out your breath. It's just to breathe is so hard. Just to even out your breathing is, is a challenge and something that you have to use mind over body to do. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I know I'm giving you a lot of, I don't know. I know. I'd rather that than you make something okay. up, but... The other way. Um, Is he still alive? Clinically, he's not going to live. What does that mean? He, he's, he's, he has he a severe, dead? yes, he has a severe brain injury. It, so much shot him in the head. It's, it's, apparently there's, there's too much damage to recover from. Okay. That's why we need to get a hold of his, his family. Parents. I don't know what his like. It, I don't know if he has an advanced directive or right. what he would have wanted. He once told me that he would want all. We joked. I said I would want to be like, if I was ever. I have an advanced directive. I do this kind of work. I run a medical legal partnership. Like if I once said if I ever was like brain dead, I would want to be like. I'd want the plug pulled. Right. And he said he would want all efforts made. Like he would be cryogenically frozen. Like he wanted every single effort that could be made to keep him alive. I know that much. My understanding, and that's what we'll have to get a hold of the family as soon as possible, but my understanding is there's irreparable damage. There's nothing that can be done. I mean, he's, I don't, I'm not there, I wasn't there, but I understand from, from previous cases that the, the brain, his, his brain is damaged beyond repair. There's nothing that can be done for that. Is he still alive? Should I bring the kids to see him? No, no, no. He has severe facial injury. So she doesn't want any criticism that she didn't bring the kids to see him. But she also still wants to look like a caring mother. And they're like, no, no. <laughs> to the really bad idea. Sarah didn't, if you didn't get the hint from Sarah, the victim's advocate, now we're telling you, Wendy, really bad idea. Jamie Hayes, thanks for becoming a, a member. Welcome aboard. I'm, I'm sorry, and, and I know this is tough, but I would not want my children to see. Okay. Okay, I just thought I got this inkling that maybe he was like still somewhat conscious and I no. wanted him to get to be with them if that, okay, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry about that, but that's, okay. that's, that's the way, the, that's the way it is. They, like I said, okay. maybe, isn't it interesting though that she doesn't want Dan Markell to have any, the comfort of his children in his final moments? That's what I would be thinking about too but no mention of how what would comfort him 
but I guess that's a, where you where you see it if you have any kind of belief in kind of a soul or that gets kind of heavy. There's severe severe uh, injury trauma. Okay. All right. Is so, there someone like is there a doctor like working on him or are they just there, there's there's doctors at the trauma bay the ER yeah. I don't I'm, I think he's been transferred to ICU okay all right and they'll have to make a determination about organs oh my god and so forth oh so hence hopefully we can uh, okay the kids yeah the kids all right now let's talk about the kids okay, okay. Okay, so that's what I have for today. That's about as much Wendy as I as I can handle, but a lot of odd moments. And I'll tell you, when you edit it, you'll see how many times she mentions that point about her kids, that they're going to come after her, come after the kids. It's all about her. She mentions... Dan Markell's family once in the beginning that they'll be upset and they'll be upset with her and that they'll think she did it. So she says multiple times in this police interview that a rational person would think she did it, that she is the best suspect. And as much as she mentioned, someone said, I think it was Dark 59 said something like, oh, is he dead yet? Have I mentioned my brother? <laughs> Have I mentioned my brother and his jokes? Have I mentioned my brother? But I believe that she wants them all protected, mostly herself. It's really everyone out for themselves in this family. But unfortunately, in this kind of crime, they're all connected. And in and that's why Wendy lies on the stand, even when she has immunity. Because to fully tell the truth would be to not only implicate herself, but expose her family and expose her mother and, and expose her brother and her father. This was a family affair. But it's such a it's such a awful, awful, awful case. They're monsters. I mean, it's like I keep saying it, but it it's like a horror movie marrying into this family. I am going to end the way I usually do. Should I take I'll just silently read to myself and you guys can read on the screen. I guess that's what that person was saying I should do. Actually, I'm going to bring in Jane Pauley and have her read it for me. Uh, this is a victim impact statement written for the state of Florida versus Sigfredo Garcia and Catherine McBanawa. And it's got a little bit of a twist to it, so... Pay attention to the till the end. Dear Judge Hankinson, in Jewish tradition, there is a legend that someone who successfully matches three people with their future spouses earns a place in heaven. There are various explanations for this story. One is that God matched Adam with Eve, so that brings spouses together is doing, so that bringing spouses together is doing God's work. In a life cut far too short, Dan Markell made two successful matches. We are one of them. We each met Dan. In the first few days of college, Adam lived two flights below Dan in his freshman dorm. Steve met Dan through his own freshman roommate. For each of us, 
our first conversations with him stand out in our memory. He wanted to know everything about us, where we grew up, how many siblings we had, what their names were, what our interests were, what we wanted to do with our lives. In the space of a few hours, it seems as though he knew everything about us. He remembered all of it. We each built strong, independent friendships with Dan, but he didn't actually introduce us until near the end of that first year in college. It certainly wasn't with the goal of making a match. That was the early 1990s. Both of us were deeply in the closet, and the notion that we would be that we could be a couple was the furthest thing from our minds. But Dan somehow sensed that we would be great friends, and it was with that in mind that he brought us together. Over the next couple of years, the three of us became an inseparable group. Senior year, we all lived together, and we remained in close, excuse me, close touch after graduation, even as Dan went off to Israel and then England on postgraduate fellowships. Steve went to study in Germany, and Adam moved back to New York City. It was in that year, 1996, that the two of us finally became a couple. We have been together ever since. We remember the joy of Dan's face when we shared our news. We were, of course, nervous about telling him. How would he react to the fact that two of his closest friends were gay and dating each other? But for Dan, the fact that we had found happiness was all that mattered, and he thought it was hilarious. He had quite literally matched Adam and Steve. At our wedding in 2006, Dan danced and celebrated with unbridled enthusiasm. He was part of the small crew who lifted our chairs and held them aloft as we celebrated another Jewish tradition. On the video, which we have watched again and again in the years since his death, you can see his happiness. This is how we will remember him. Over the next few years, with our lives centered in New York and his in Tallahassee, we saw less of Dan. Still, our friendship endured as we each welcomed children into our lives. One of our last visits with Dan was in Cambridge in May 2013. We had just moved here to take new jobs, and Dan's visit coincided with our oldest son's fourth birthday party, which meant we didn't have much time to spend with him. But he joined the party, mingling with the others, preschool parents, and having a great time. Even though he didn't know anybody, an occasion was marked by, a sing, by sing-alongs and cupcakes rather than grown-up conversation. Dan took so much pride in the fact that we had children because, for him, children were life's greatest gift. Dan's love for his two boys was obvious and overwhelming. It defined him. There were the central, they were the central focus of his life. Excuse me. One of the greatest tragedies of Dan's death is that those boys are now being raised by the very people who conspired to have him murdered and who are working every day to erase his memory from their lives. We hope they do not succeed. We always imagined we would have Dan with us over the decades, challenging us and cheering us as we move through the stages of our lives. We expected more visits, more meals, more stories. We looked forward to telling our kids how Dan brought us together and telling Dan's kids silly stories about his high school jinx. Hi, jinx. 
We look forward to one day comparing notes with Dan as our children started college and formed adult friendships of their own and perhaps attending the weddings of each other's children. None of this will come to pass. Nor did Dan ever have the chance to make his third match, though we have little doubt he would have. But as abbreviated as Dan's life was, we know that God saw the light in his beautiful soul and how hard Dan worked to prepare our broken world. We know that Dan earned his place in heaven. Dan's academic study was justice, a topic that was the core at the core of his being. Writing about justice fused his passion for Jewish study, his instinctive sense of right and wrong, and his love of argument and debate, as well as his delight in taking provocative, provocative excuse me, stands. It saddens us beyond measure that the subject to which Dan devoted his academic life now hangs over his death like an inescapable shadow. Will there be justice in our lifetime for Dan? Will there be appropriate punishment for the people responsible for taking the life of our friend? Will there be some consequence that deters others from committing such heinous crimes? We ask you, your honor to do everything in your power to answer those questions with a definitive yes. Sincerely, Adam L. Berger, Stephen E. Frank. That's what I have for today, folks. I'll be back tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern with another episode. Please hit the thumbs up. It really helps get my work out there. Share this episode. Subscribe. Leave me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. And I just got a whole bunch of new episodes up there. And I'll see you back tomorrow. Have a great night, everybody.